Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the restart of the summer semester at Grand Rounds. Thanks very much for coming um, and, uh, and for working out that we're in a different room, which it t took me a while to work out, <laughs> I have to say. So I've just sat and listened to a, a significant chunk of a manual handling lecture, uh, <laughs> wondering what's going on. Anyway, Phil, th thanks for making it here. Um, I hope you had a nice Easter. I uh, hope you enjoyed the summer, that weekend we had in the middle of Easter, uh, and it's all over now. Um, but uh, the programme for this semester starts today with a visiting speaker, um, and we have a number of visiting speakers actually through the, through the programme, but we have some gaps. So if you're sat there thinking you want to fill that gap, please let me know, uh, and um, we'll try and fill the gaps through the rest of the programme. Uh, we go all the way through into the middle of July when I go on holiday cycling in France, so it all stops then, and then we start again back in September. So today, uh, Natalie Colson uh, is, is a visiting academic from uh, the Gold Coast in Queensland, where it's significantly warmer than it is here. I see you're wrapped up nice and warm. <laughs> um, she tells me that she's a geneticist uh, and a dietitian, nutritionist. Um, um, oh, <coughs> excellent. Do come in, do come in. Um, uh, and she is going to talk to us uh, about strategies from down under to enhance the student experience, which I'm very much looking forward to, um, particularly as in the context of us trying to uh, re renovate our undergraduate curriculum. So if you'd missed that, um, or if you're interested, you can watch the YouTube video, which is online, of, the, of um, Ellie Hothersall's talk earlier in the year. And we have another talk coming up. Um, in a, I think it's in June with an update on how the curriculum planning changes uh, are going ahead. So look out for that. So thank you very much for coming all this way, Natalie, and thanks very much for speaking at Grand Rounds. Thank you very much. Thanks everyone for coming and listening to my talk. Uh, I thought I'd start off by just showing you where I come from because most people, when I say I'm from Australia, they say, oh, Sydney or Melbourne, or most people don't know where the Gold Coast is. So the Gold Coast is actually as you can see, just south of Brisbane and just north of Byron Bay. If you've heard of Byron Bay, where all the celebrities seem to go and get their houses. Um, so the Gold Coast is a city and it's actually situated on about 50 kilometres of open beach. So it's a nice place to live. Um, and it's a reasonably new city, quite a new city for about the 60s, I suppose. It started developing, so we don't have any of the history and the beautiful history that you have here. Um, but um, anyway, that's where we are, lots of high rises, it's a big tourist destination, University, um, Griffith University, where I'm at, situated, is the biggest university on the Gold Coast, there's three universities on the Gold Coast. <coughs> so the campus, uh, Gold Coast campus, has got about 18,000 students and it's a real focus on health education. And I'm very much involved in health education because my background is a geneticist with my PhD in human genetics and then I trained as a dietitian and nutritionist afterwards. So I'm involved in educating students from a range of health um, degrees, degree programs. And I know you call programs and courses different things here, so I hope I make sense with what I'm saying. Um, so, you know, we have, you know, medicine, for example, undergraduate medicine. So we have students who come in through the undergraduate medicine program, they do a fast track, like a two-year biomedical science degree, and then they go and do their clinical medicine. Or we also have students who do biomedical science, and 99.9% .9 of them, and I was program director for a long time, want to get into medicine, but, you know, 20% get in, um, you know, and, and many other sort of um, degree programs that are involved in, that are at the campus. So... We have this foundation, foundation Year Health Program, so it commenced in 2007, and basically almost all of the undergraduate health programs do this common first year. And the first year has got eight courses or subjects, and so students can, within reason, of course, do a little bit of movement between, of course, they can't go from exercise science to medicine, of course, it's still OP-driven, but nevertheless. Um, so it started off with about 500 students and now it's up to 1,000 students and I've been involved in it from the very start. So I wanted to talk about five things. I chose five things that I've been involved in uh, from the course or subject level up to the faculty level that we have done, implemented and we believe has enhanced the experience for students. So I'll get straight into them. 
So the first one is the research encounter. We've published on a few of these. I'll show you the publications. So back in the beginning of the Foundation Year Health, the university had a strategic direction to um, embed research-based learning into the curriculum. So we thought, oh, great, how are we going to do this with you know, 500 first-year students? How is this going to work? So um, we had an idea what we might be able to do. So it was important that you know, we wanted these first-year students to understand about what's going on in their discipline, but also what's going on with the academic staff because they really don't have any idea what we do. And I remember when I was a student, I was exactly the same, had no clue. I thought, what a good life. You know, they must just go and deliver lectures and then what, what do they do then? Oh, it must be so good, but of course that's not reality. Um, so that was important. We wanted them then to produce a piece of work that mimicked inquiry and knowledge creation, which is, you know, what researchers and academics do. So, and of course, we knew there were a lot of benefits so that they'd sort of understand what was going on. It, they, it would demystify um, the culture of what was going on in the university and the research. And also student-faculty relationships, that was important. And student-student relationships, because these were first-year students. Um, but of course, we knew we had this large first-year cohort. So, what we did is we developed this, this project called the Research Encounter. We applied for a small teaching and learning grant just to get it up and running initially. So what we did is we break students up into small groups. So there's 500 students. There are about 100 groups, so approximately five students per group. We tried to keep them within their discipline as much as possible. Um, and we, what we did was we arranged for them to interview an academic staff member, a researcher, um, a clinician, a PhD student or a master's student, and also we got the university executive involved and uh, got them to go and interview the executive as well. And then the students went away and they created a poster and they presented the poster at a student symposium. And here you can see, we've got three examples of me there. If, you know, the students did a poster of me on Facebook. You know, it's interesting what they do from their interview and how they, um, the information that they get and how they present it got other academic staff there and you know with the students and the tutors in the labs. What we did is we supported the students with resources so they got a poster template and lots of information you know about referencing and that type of thing. Um, we had an administration officer who runs it, a little bit of work involved. The posters are actually um, physical posters but for this year for the first time it's been going for about 10 years we're going to make them electronic, see how that goes, it'll save quite a bit of money. Um, then they're graded, the students are graded at this symposium, 15%, um, three tutors grade, it's average. And then the group members, because you know with group work there's usually issues. So the group members actually anonymously peer assess each other. So say a group got um, 14 out of 15 by the tutors, then each group member has an opportunity to say, okay, well, this group member is worth 100%, you know, this one hardly ever turned up, they're only worth 50%. So it all sort of, they get a chance, an opportunity to um, assess and evaluate each other and that seemed to work really well. So um, this is an example of <laughs> a couple of the posters. This professor obviously is involved in dentistry, mentally dental, really captured him to a T. <laughs> doing a really good job. Um, this is our head of school, actually, and head of anatomy. <laughs> some of them are fun and some of them are quite serious. Um, they do all sorts of amazing things. You know, sometimes they put little, somehow they make little voice things that you press a button and somebody talks or there's a sound or something. So they've been very amazingly creative with it. We published on this. And I presented this to Edinburgh actually only recently and they are interested in their biomedical science um, first year in um, maybe having a go at running this. Some of the things we were really keen to happen for the students or the students to get out of it and we, were, we believe we were quite successful with this, that they know the kind of research that's been conducted in their school and that they know some of the research questions in their discipline. So that's a really good part to read. 
and they know what lecturers do and how they contribute to scientific knowledge, that we don't just come along and give our lectures and go home. Um, what a research high degree student does, because that's one, th you know, one thing in particular that was important, we found that, um, you know, that students had no idea that there were these pathways into research high degree. And also they felt a sense of connection with some of their peers, some of their fellow students, so it was quite successful. One thing that came up which we thought was quite interesting was that students who may have thought about doing um, a higher degree or asking about whether they thought about doing a higher degree, after they'd done the research encounter, less seemed to be keen on doing a research higher degree. And we found out that the research higher degree students were telling them that, you know, they didn't sleep and um, they didn't eat and, you know, <laughs> all these terrible stories. So we realised that we had to sort of coach the research higher degree students a little bit better about what this was all about. And please don't terrify the students, first year students. Okay. So the second thing is authentic directed case study. So this is something that I've been mainly involved in. Um, so I teach this first year course, genetics course, foundation year course for genes and disease. And, um, you know, students come along to this course, half the class hasn't done any genetics, haven't done any genetics before, half the class have done a little bit of genetics. But I really wanted students I was interested in the whole idea of, you know, student empowerment, learner empowerment. So I wanted to do something that could maybe help students feel empowered. And again, I had these foundation year students. So I was interested in the characteristics of, in what are considered characteristics of empowerment and that meaning was one of them and competence was another one. So I was really interested in using case studies in the course. It was genes and disease. So the students learnt this molecular complex molecular genetics, and then they learned about disease, and the, part, the disease part I wanted to use case studies, and I thought it was important that they needed to be authentic and not ones that I made up, because I remember the ones that were made up when I was, I was a student, I just didn't really like them, they were obviously made up. Um, so meaning and also um, developing you know, mastery and competence is important to feel that they're developing this mastery and competence. And, seeing that they can actually apply their knowledge to what's happening in the real world. So to me it was important to use real case studies, authentic case studies. And so I sourced them from PubMed or Medline. Uh, there's, there are many really good case reports in PubMed or Medline. And I wanted those particular case studies that I used to enhance what the students were learning in the particular topic of the course. And they were integrated into the curric curriculum and there were, I wrote, learning objectives for them because they are very complex, most of them are very complex, you know, genetics case studies, and they were assessed. So this is an example of a case study. Anyone, um, anyone, does this make sense to anybody? No, it's, it's, yeah, it's basically about translocations involved in Philadelphia chromosome, but this one was a really complex case where there were many translocations. And so the students were learning about translocations, learning about the Philadelphia chromosome that's involved in chronic myeloid leukaemia. But yeah, this is complex. It goes into um, treatment and you know the patient coming back, etc. So you think, oh, first year students, that's really that's that's tough. But it actually, wasn't tough because I the way I did it was this directed approach. So normally with a case study, it's, you, you use an open end, or most people use an open ended. Um, case study where there's a problem and the problem needs solving. But with directed case studies, there's a story, scenario or case, this case report, and then you actually ask leading questions, specific questions about the case. So all that complex detail may not be involved at all, but there are particular points that are, that are important. So students, students had to identify, for example, about translocations from that particular one and it was very controlled by me, by the teacher. So when I provided the information of the case, I took it and put it into the course materials, but they also had access, of course, to the full paper. So some students who really were keen to get stuck into, into it and go further it had access, but then they knew that that wasn't a requirement and that you know, there were specific learning objectives for assessment. And so, so this, 
I started to integrate, I use this integrated approach where um, gradually I started to, you know, revisit some of the cases and my later topics and sometimes I extended the questions as the students got started going through the course, they went through the topics. But still very much directed and teacher controlled but starting to get them into more sort of open-ended questions. So what did the students think about them? The students really liked them. Like the way one student said it was a treat at the end of the class. Wow. <laughs> I wanted to see if students, by actually exposing them to these complex case studies, I wanted to see if students were able to handle more higher order thinking questions. So. Um, I started putting higher order thinking questions into the exams and I found that, you can see here, that they certainly seemed to get similar results after the case study. They looked at two groups that were very similar in other courses so that, um, you know, it wasn't really a year thing and they seemed to start to be able to handle the synthesis and analysis questions, more of them, handle them better. Okay, third one. I know I'm rushing through these things but just sort of giving you an overview. Um, so we have in this foundation year help, we have all these um, laboratories associated with many of the courses, you know, chemistry one and two, um, xenomygenetics, anatomy and physiology one and two, for example. And we have, in, particularly in the anatomy laboratory, we've got um, a great anatomy facility, we've got cadaveric material and, you know, many models and that type of thing. And the concern was that, um, our laboratory tutors or demonstrators, I think you call them demonstrators, we tend to call them tutors, that they had the very generic basic training and that this training really wasn't appropriate for the type of laboratories um, or the type of teaching that they were doing. So we wanted to develop some sort of training program. So we got a learning and teaching grant for it. And then we developed this uh, professional development framework and you know we're really interested in reflective practice was important and also situated learning for these tutors and we wanted to, be to develop this community of practice um, amongst the tutors as well and also of course if the tutors feel confident and it improves um, you know their confidence in the way they're doing their job of course it's, it's a much better experience for the students as well. So what we did, we developed this matrix, this three P's matrix, based on um, professionalism, preparation and participation. And then we recruited tutors. So we wanted both experienced and novice tutors to be involved in the program. And there was, and there was a senior academic. So actually there was a triad um, that, that was created. So what had happened in the laboratory class, there would be tutor who was or demonstrator that was who was demonstrating uh, who would be then um, observed and then two people would observe there would be a peer and there would be a senior academic and, um, and we had documentation to complete during this observation so initially there was a workshop where all the tutors came along and then you know we did we talked about um, this, this framework and the benefits of being involved in the program. Tutors were involved in the program, we gave them a certificate at the end. And then they, we formed a triad with the peer and the senior um, academic staff member. And there was a first observation. Then after that observation, we'd all go and have coffee. Three of us would go and have coffee. It was meant to be, it was a very supportive environment, not, you know, you should have done this, you should have done that, nothing like that. Um, and we found that the actual tutor peers gave some fantastic ideas and fantastic feedback. And then there was a second observation to you know, have a discussion, well, at the first, op at the first um, feedback to have a discussion and sort of see if there might be any ideas that that, um, that tutor would like to try in their next um, observation. Second observation and final feedback, um, coffee feedback. So all, as I said, all very supportive. This just gives you an idea of uh, talking about that framework. So this is the professionalism framework that we use. So whether there's sufficient evidence, insufficient evidence for these, you know, various aspects. 
things like you know health and safety and professional attitude towards uh, the students and peers, etc. Okay, so we did some feedback. I've uh, got some feedback, focus group feedback, and this is what some of the things that some of the tutors said. So you know they didn't know how to gauge their performance, and this gave them an idea. You know, it wasn't just us critiquing them um, at all. In fact, to be honest, I got some great ideas by being one of the academics observing some of the things some of the students do are fantastic. And definitely, um, you know, a two-way process. So it's been quite successful. It's been running for several years now and we've published on it. Fourth one, blank page technique for learning anatomy. So again, I was saying, mentioning before, we have these, this fantastic anatomy facility. Um, and we have first year students actually have access, first year um, help students access to this facility where they get to see um, you know, the fabric material and you know, lots and you know, it's a great facility. But we were really concerned, you know, they, it was really resource rich, so many resources for them, but were they actually involved in active learning? Um, you know, deep active learning. And, um, well, you know, we're thinking about students' awareness of their learning metacognition, which is quite interesting, about 1,500 something words. Well, I'm not going to say it because I seem to get confused when I say it. <laughs> but then my colleague who convenes anatomy and physiology said, yes, and I so agree with this. Some of my students don't know something, at the same time don't know that they don't know it. So true. So we need to get them to think about their learning. So some of the strategy or, uh, strategies for students to uh, think about their learning, to become deep and autonomous learners, is to plan a learning task. So the learning task, this particular learning task is the blank page technique. Um, and then monitor their understanding. So the blank page techniques involve students during one of the laboratories. So they'll have all these stations that they'll go around. And one of the stations is actually a room with nothing in it but a whiteboard. And they can either write, and there's a task there, a particular task. And they can either write on the whiteboard or they can create a model with plasticine. But they have nothing to refer to. They have to do it from their own memory. That's the blank page technique. After they've had a go at it, after they've had about 10, 15 minutes of a go at it, they can then have a look at a textbook for a short time and they can come back and have another go. So, and that gives them an opportunity to reflect upon things that they're missing, so gaps in their knowledge. This has been published on. Um, we also looked at students who actually, we looked at how they fared in assessment for students who actually went through this blank page technique or this room with nothing in it compared to students who didn't. And those who actually uh, did this blank page technique fared a little bit better with their assessment. So that's the room. Students go in, why am I doing this? And then they have a go at this particular task. Do I really own this knowledge? And then, what don't I know? So they're really thinking about their learning process. That's quite nice, one of the models that was produced. Nice to see model. And these are some of the drawings that they've done on the whiteboard with nothing, blank page. Students say, well, it assisted in their learning. They found it was most useful. This is um, got a five point scale here. So you can see mode was four. They ranked it as very good as a learning tool. You can see five. The mode here is five. Five out of five. And they said that it made them think, which was really important.
Okay. And the final, I'm just going to, yep, we have a time. The final topic I'd like to talk about um, involved this, my course, my genetics course, Genes and Disease. A couple of years ago, I decided to flip it. It's a reasonably large course. I've got about 350 to 400 students. And, um, you know, I thought, well, the course is difficult to run because I get students, half the class have done some genetics before and the other half hasn't. So, of course, they've got to learn genetics like a completely new language and they find it quite, com quite difficult. But then the ones that have done it before in the beginning when I'm doing the catch-up, those, if they've done it before, I lose them very quickly. And I just go, oh, I've been there, done that. So off they go and they don't come back to lectures. But actually after week four, so week five, it starts to get quite complex. And then, of course, I've already lost them. I find there's lots of last minute cramming. Of course, all our lectures are lecture captured or recorded, so the students you know, use that. But then they actually don't, when you look at the lecture captures, they, to see the, the viewings, they don't actually look at the lecture captures. I think they plan to, but it doesn't happen. I found you know, it was really difficult. It was a large class, and they set up the back of the lecture theatre, and you know, it's really hard to get them to engage. So I decided I'm going to flip it. So certainly flipped classrooms. There's plenty of evidence you know, that flipped classrooms are really useful and increase student engagement and also performance. But there's also evidence that students hate the word flipped. Mm. So I didn't call it flipped. Um, and you know, better grades, but you need to encourage them to attend. So with flipped classrooms, you put the material online and then you have tutorials where you discuss um, the content. But I had the same feeling with the first year students that if the, the, there wasn't any encouragement to get them to come along to the tutorials, then I'd have the same thing. I'd lose them. So I needed to encourage them with assessment. So I, I did, I put assessment, a, a small um, item of assessment in all of my tutorials so students were encouraged to attend them all. So I you know, replaced the lectures with online material, so I had to record all the online material. And then there were tutorials, so seven points of tutorials. So it was a 12 week course, and there were also laboratories, which didn't change. And, won't go into detail about the assessment or anything, it's not really important, but one thing in particular is that tutorials had to be very, very carefully planned. So there were two hour tutorials, I had to do seven repeats of them. Um, I went to them all in the first year because I thought it was important that I sort of see how the whole thing runs so I can sort of, if anything needed to be changed, I can sort of do that quickly. So if over my two year, uh, sorry, two hour tutorials, I had to mostly cover two modules or two topics uh, so I did a short recap, I talked about the case study, and then I, for 60 minutes, an hour, the students broke into groups, and then <coughs> they discussed particular problems, specific problems, including the case study questions. And the groups, I named them genetics terms, so they'd start to get used to that genetics language. And then at the end, the groups, someone in the group had to report the answers back to the class and used a catch box. Has anyone used a catch box, throwable mic? Yeah, they're great, it's so good. And if they hit each other in the head, it doesn't hurt, I think. <laughs> um, and then I did a quiz at the end. So students, of course, if they missed out, with that, they didn't come to the tutorial, they missed out on the 3% at the end unless they had a medical certificate. And with that quiz, it was peer marked immediately so that they got instant feedback. Because with a large class like that, it was hard to get, you know, in our student evaluations, feedback was always a problem. So I explained to them, I'm doing this to try and get get you feedback straight away so you know how you're going. So when they're peer marked, they know how they went. They get the answer straight away. I, I found it really important and they commented that this was very helpful because this was their first flipped class that they had that it attended. So I had to give them a weekly checklist. So okay, before you come along to the tutorial or the lab, you have, you should have watch these modules, try some of these questions, etc. So that was very helpful, I found, for them. So what were the good things? Well, certainly an improved engagement. I got to know the students, which was really good. Um, they did better, students performed better, and I did check that against the years with other courses, subjects, to make sure that it wasn't just a year effect. Um, and I'm actually, um, in the middle of um, 
preparing a manuscript about this. Students worked together. Sometimes they didn't like that, but nevertheless, I mean, that's what life's about. Um, the cramming didn't seem to happen. I had a Facebook group. I always had a Facebook group, and I used to monitor it. And, you know, honestly, I used to have to stay out way past midnight the night before the exam because the questions would just keep on coming. But it just didn't happen because they did their weekly quizzes, and they, because they were very much motivated by these quizzes to keep up with the content, the cramming just didn't seem to happen. Um, and of course, as I said, yeah, the engagement. And it, it was a much better experience for the staff as well. Uh, it was quite enjoyable going along, to, going along to the tutorials and getting to know the students. But of course, it costs more money. Um, Griffith is quite keen, very much involved in active learning or getting active learning um, in our programs. And I've been, in, I've been on the academic staff member on this committee actually at the moment to try and get this involved. But, and so they're prepared to spend more money, but it does cost more money because I needed to get staff members with me to run the assessment in the tutorials um, or to help me with the assessment. And of course, there was so much more contact time for me. Um, some of the students said, oh, you know, I have to have a small item of assessment every week. It's stressful. I can't cope with it. Most students didn't, though. I had to very carefully time manage those tutorials. And um, of course, it's difficult sometimes with timetabling because I needed venues that could facilitate active learning, venues where you could move the furniture around. This is the student feedback. Um, you can see from 2016 to 2017, the difference, the increase, um, and that's all. Oh, actually, I haven't got the p-values there, but most of those are significant. The pictures are significant. Um, so yes, it, it was it was quite successful. Of course, those not sorry, those numbers are out of five as well. What did the students say? And they they said it helped me keep up with the content instead of cramming at the end. And of course, that a big part of that obviously was embedding assessment into the tutorials, so that students would come along to the tutorials prepared, having watched the online material, to know that they were going to be assessed on it. They have to waste time attending lectures. What a waste of time. None of that. <laughs> and they found it stressful, so as I was saying. Yeah, you know, it's heavily promoted to keep up with the content, the stress that came along with the assessment was not something that was helpful or was counterproductive to learning the content, which doesn't quite make sense. Anyway, nevertheless. But at some point it was the fear of losing marks that, um, rather than keeping up with the content. Okay. Nevertheless, they still kept up with the content. Okay, that's it. They're my five things, the five strategies of other strategies, of course we've done other things, but they're five things I thought that may be of interest and just wanted to um, acknowledge some of my peers um, for all the work involved in this as well. Thanks everyone. Thanks very much, I think that's really interesting stuff isn't it? And, and um, some of the things that you talked about are things that we are, we are doing in some ways or other, some things we've dipped our toe in in the past and and, and, uh, and come against obstacles and some things that we're thinking about doing. Right. Um, and, and I think uh, a lot of the flipped classroom stuff, which we'll not call flipped, yes. uh, um, I don't know what we're going to call it instead, but um, we've really been trying to, to do a lot of that, uh, And but it's the, it's, the in, it's the input, isn't it? It's the amount of time that's required of, 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 of us as the tutors in an increasingly time-crunched group of teachers, Absolutely. particularly uh, as many of the people in this room are clinicians and it's, it's busy to get that time. Um, do you, how much extra support did you have for, for doing these things? I mean, is it, is, it, is it just you? I mean, are you just the sole crusader doing all this stuff? Um, some of it's... Speaking of busy clinician, when you go... Some of it's done with um, flipping the classroom. I mostly did it myself, but... Um, we had already prepared the online material for 
another, something else I didn't present was we totally changed the foundation and curriculum actually, but we um, repeated all the courses in a mixed mode condensed version. Um, and so we'd already had the online material was available. And if, the cl if you could get a classroom, it, it was really the size of the classroom that meant all these repeats, because if you had a smaller classroom, it really isn't extra work at all. Once you've put the material online, it's not, in fact, it's, it's easier in a way because the students have already come prepared, the material's online, and then it's more of an active learning sort of tutorial. So it's not, it's not really more work like that. Yeah, we, we've done a, a lot of team-based learning stuff in the last sort of five, six years or so. Um, and if you go into our other lecture theatre, you'll see we're all set up for team-based learning environments. And I think for those people who buy into it, it works very well. You know, the, if they do the material beforehand, you, you can, but there's still those pockets of people who don't do the material beforehand, and they and either they don't come, or they sit there and it's yeah. just oh. Yeah, what's, yeah. So that's why I tied in the assessments. Yeah, yeah. it is interesting. That you talk about the assessments being so imp imp important. When I was at medical school, oh crikey, uh, t 25 years ago, our anatomy teaching was assessments every second week, oh. anatomy demonstration mm -hmm. every every second Friday exam test didn't go towards the end mark but you turned up and somebody examined you and you and you and it put the fear of god into you but you did it um and we've we uh we've, we've moved away from that yeah. um it's it's very motivating Absolutely. having the professor of anatomy rock up to your, de your cadaver and say what's that does anybody have any questions or comments they'd like to uh, uh i'm just going to see if this didn't make these things charge up oh crikey that's what you get for being in a different room. Thank you. Um, that was really interesting. I mean, you looked at five different areas and you've shown some evidence of changes that have happened from each of those areas. Um, I'm not sure about the Australian system. Is there anything at more, is there anything at the meta level that you're sort of looking at? So in this country, it would be the National Student Survey. Has there been any change in um, student satisfaction with the program overall, or has there been any change in your progression retention rates that you could sort of use to measure the, you know, the effect of all of these? These are things we're certainly measuring, um, but I couldn't say whether... Shuffling you back to the microphone. <laughs> there you go. Um, I can't say, I mean... We are tracking things like, for example, we're tracking graduates for the research encounter. We're tracking graduates and um, seeing if they're being becoming involved in research, if there's any increased involvement in research. But these are, I suppose I can't say just these things. These are five things, but there are lots of other things that we have been doing. Um, but these are certainly things that we have, that I have been involved in that I wanted to present. But yet yeah, we do track, but I, I couldn't say yes, you know, if we have increased student satisfaction, we, we do have those surveys, the graduate surveys as well. I mean, I couldn't claim. I'd say I couldn't, wouldn't be right to claim. <laughs> Other questions? Oh, crikey. A geneticist. Friendly face. Oh, thank you. I think that was an excellent you know, series of different things. Actually, I want to try some of them. How do you maintain interest when you're repeating amongst your staff when you're repeating the same thing seven times within a week. I mean, my favourite week has a 12 tutorial repeat in it, and it, I'd really struggle to get people to feel really enthusiastic for tutorial number 12. Mm. Well, <laughs> that's an interesting question because um, it is hard to keep, keep them enthused. I'm very careful who I've chosen um, in fact, the two people I've chosen, I have two pe mainly two people um, who are my tutors and one, one young man who's um, a medical student has gone, now gone off to medical school, got accepted, but um, both of them were very keen to get academic positions. So therefore, they have been very good and very enthusiastic and um, you know, want to show how good they are. So I, I can only answer in that way, in that, um, my careful selection, I think I was fortunate to select people, or have people available who were sort of ready to move into academia and so could use that as a way to demonstrate their enthusiasm. 
<laughs> but it, it's hard even myself. Honestly, in the final one, sometimes I'd just be burbling because not so much enthusiasm, but because I'd done it over and over, you know, sort of over two and a half days. So that's hard. That's tough. I'm sorry, I can't really answer that one. <laughs> Hi, um, that was a really interesting talk, thank you. Um, thank you. I was wondering if you, so as I understand, you teach this foundation, foundation Health Year, and that's for clinical and non-clinical students. So there'll be Some students are. there. Yeah. Mm. Um, and I was just wondering if you ever analyse the data in terms of those two student groups. And I guess the reason I'm asking is because I tend to meet students when they're in their third year, and then they'll have had either two years of MBCHB, so medical clinical degree, or two years of biomedical degree. Uh, okay. And I get very different feedback in terms of assessments and how we're teaching for those two groups and I wondered if that was something intrinsic or is something that we've actually yeah. like trained into them. There's no, there's really no clinical training in that foundation year so they really don't, even the, the medical students don't get the clinical training until the end of the second year, um, dietetic students really until we go out onto placement, um, we don't have nursing students so really just thinking about physio, no, no, none of them are doing anything clinical. So we really couldn't split at that stage. Oh, but you, I mean, you mean that they go into their own year at that stage, they're not necessarily... We do. Right, yeah, so I was just wondering if you'd ever looked at the, if there's something about the ones that will be doing the clinical degree versus the ones that will be doing the non-clinical degree and how they respond to... Interesting, and no. We tend to look at them, we tend to separate the medical students out <laughs> because they're, you know, these high achieving, high expectation students, so we do tend to analyse their, them separately, but not the others we haven't, so that's interesting. Oh, crikey. Thank you for a very nice presentation. Thank you. I was just thinking about the blank page technique, and, and when you presented it, first of all, and you said it's a blank page with... Uh, Plasticine. I didn't catch it was anatomy, so I was really confused about how they oh, would use sorry. the plasticine for teaching anything else. But yeah. that's okay. But it it uh, it makes me think: has have, has it been used for teaching other topics? I can imagine students being terrified at the idea. Of what do you start with a blank blank screen if it isn't something like anatomy? Yeah. I, th I think it sounds fascinating. I have used it a little bit in my genetics course um, when I'll ask students to come up and. Um, draw a replication fork, for example, on, on the whiteboard without anything, or meiosis without anything. Um, I haven't actually evaluated it, mm -hmm. but I certainly do use that technique myself. I, I'm not, I don't believe anyone else has um, within the foundation year, but it's, it seems to work really well. There's pressure, but then they certainly think about what they don't know. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. It was really interesting. I've been trying to influence our staff to do peer observation of teaching quite a bit here, but people find it really intimidating. Have you got any tips for how you can make people feel a little bit less intimidated about the whole process? Uh, so peer observation of teaching, do you mean for um, tutors, demonstrators? I think it's important to have their peers involved in it and not just an academic staff member so that they don't feel that... Um, you know, we're just sort of checking up on them and, you know, we're going to pick on them or whatever. And I think it's also important so that they see the framework, so that that three-piece framework that we have, whether there's, you know, sufficient evidence, not sufficient evidence, so we're not saying, oh, you know, they did this or that. Um, so see the paperwork. But also I think it's the um, how we deal with the feedback sessions. They're very supportive. We have a coffee and we just sit around and chat and then... Then they talk amongst themselves and go, it was fine. It wasn't what I thought. <laughs> so word start, started to, starts to spread. Yeah. Well, then we won't hear you on YouTube. I was looking at your first slide about the group that you mentioned. Yes. Nothing would put me off doing medicine more than the sort of attitude that I was hearing from the somewhat disillusioned staff at the time. And I, you came across that with a PhD student. And I, 
what is the purpose of this? Because if it's in simply to show that research is valuable, that maybe it will do, but if you want to get people thinking critically, do you not want to try and give those groups of students a project to do over a year, or can you build something in that where they can actually analyze something or look at something in a critical context rather than just based perhaps around that research and the program they're doing? Because I'm not sure it's getting there from, from what you've shown me. Um, well, it's, it's not only about research, it's about a lot of, lot of different things, but we really wanted the students to understand the process of research, how academic staff and the university is involved in research, um, that was really important, how they can try different things in their career, so to actually speak firsthand to those people. And yes, absolutely, we did have problems with the RHD students, but we haven't had problems with the other staff members. Staff members enjoy it as well. Um, we found there are benefits for the staff members in that they get, and particularly the, I mean, I know it's not, I'm not talking about the students, but particularly the executive get an opportunity. But students do get chance, get a chance to do research projects absolutely in their programs. There's no, but not, not when they first arrive, first semester, first trimester, we have trimesters. This is on the ground running, basically. So I don't think they would have the capability to do a small project. Perhaps I could be wrong about that. But um, no, there certainly are opportunities a little bit further down the track for medical students in the second year. They get it in the second year for most other students, second or third year. But you know, we wanted to do something that could sort of get them into the university, get them involved in with their peers. Um, I mean, they do a symposium where they present, and it has to be in a course, so it has to be over twelve weeks. We can't do it over a year. That's how how the program runs. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to draw things to a close. That's um, sorry, we've uh, that's been a fantastic presentation. Thank you very much. Um, I think it's got a lot of things for us to think about. Um, we are developing our curriculum and going through a, a change right now. And if you can come, if you want to know about those changes, come back to Grand Rounds later in June. Um, thanks very much for coming. Thanks very much, Natalie, for taking the time to speak to us. And uh, we'll see you again next week. <laughs>